Parsha 101, Parshas Bechukosai. The Chukosai is actually the last Parsha, last Torah portion in the book of Vayikra. So in Shul, when they finish reading this, at the end, everyone will stand and proclaim Chazak, Chazak, Venis Chazak, shall be strengthened. Anyway, this week's Torah portion, the Chukosai, the name of it comes from the first verse of the Torah portion in the Chukosai Telecho Ves Mitzvasai Teshmer. If you will walk in my ways, kind of if you're going to follow my rules and you're going to guard my mitzvahs, etc. This it's actually interesting. The Rebbe once said a sicha at a parade where he didn't say the word im, im which means if. Just because he said it's not a question of whether or not if it's going to happen. Of course it's going to happen. It's when it's going to happen. Anyways, this is, the parsha starts off with if you're going to go on my ways and talks about all the reward God's going to give. So it starts off on a very high and positive note. And it says, I'm going to give you rain in their times and in their season. And it's not just you're going to have rain when you need it, but it's be, going to be at a very uh, convenient time for you. So, for example, at nighttime, you know, no one's working their fields at nighttime. Or specifically on a Friday night, and one's at home with their family. Um, the land's going to yield its produce. You're going to eat, you're going to be satisfied, you're going to dwell in peace. There's going to be security. There's not going to be any foreign people No, uh, trying to, you know, take over your place. Um, there's going to be any wild beasts beasts, all that kind of stuff. Now, it's actually interesting that all the reward that we get for mitzvahs, which are spiritual, it's divine service, and they're all spiritual, you see that they're going to manifest in physical. And that's kind of exactly what it is. So we see, for example, like when someone's overcome by a great emotion, they have a lot of joy or something they want to sing, they want to dance, they want to clap, right? Because it's something that infuses and takes over your entire being. So this, of course, is what Torah, mitzvahs, Judaism, connection to God, service of God is supposed to be that. Something that takes over, it, we feel it so much, it takes over and infuses our entire being. It pervades everything that it's actually comes out in the body. It's not just something that's relegated to the mind or the heart. So the same way that in this regard, it's going to become, it's physical for us. So to the results of what we do, we'll also have physical results, tangible results that we'll see in the physical world. Um, it talks about how that it keeps going with all the blessings and the and all the reward, the physical reward that we get. The enemies are going to fall before you. Five of you will chase down a hundred of them, or a or, uh, uh, hundred of you will chase down 10,000 of them, and I'm going to multiply you. I'm going to establish my covenant with you. You're going to have so much harvest, and it's going to be so much, and everything's going to be so amazing. I'm going to dwell in your midst. I'm going to walk among you. I'm, you know, I'm, your, I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful blessings. All this, as God promises, as a reward for going in his ways. Then the Torah, then the portion shifts a little bit. And this is a big, thick section that's coming now. And it's actually, it's the third Torah reading. And you'll notice that no one is called up to the Torah in this one. It's usually the Torah reader reads this section because this is now a massive section with a bunch of curses. And for those, for those who know, we know that especially like in Yiddish, there's very original, you know, all your teeth should fall out except for once you could have a toothache, you know, <laughs> very creative. So imagine the person who created those who could be creative is now going to tell you, is going to tell us now what's going to happen. God forbid, God forbid, if we do not, however, follow in your ways, in his ways. And he gets, uh, is, we're not going to go through all of it because it is just obviously terrible, <laughs> absolutely terrible. And it's just, God's like, if, however, you do not fall in ways and you don't listen and you don't do the mitzvah and you despise my rules, right? You, you're going to re reject me and my ordinances and you're going to prevent others from doing it and you're going to deny my commandments and you're going to break my covenant. If you do those things, then, and it just goes, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of this is this and this is going to happen. And also if you keep persisting, this and this is going to happen. And this in a personal way, in a, in a larger way. Basically, God says, I'm going to do the same to you. There's going to be this, this disorientation that's going to be your miss. There's going to be consumption and blisters and fevers that there's no hope of there's no hope of recovery from. And your soul's going to come depressed. And you're going to sow your seeds in vain. Right? Your enemies, either, either it's not going to grow. If it does grow, the enemies are just going to come and eat it. Right? Which is worse. One of the worst things is to work and work and work and it all becoming futile. Right? The, the futility of stuff is, is... And work in vain is just... is. This is one of the things that God's telling uh, the Jewish people will happen if you don't follow in my ways. Um, you're going to flee even though no one's chasing you. The enemies are going to rule over you. And it says like the skies are going to be like iron, right? Because iron doesn't sweat, as in it's not going to rain. It's going to be drought. The land's going to be like copper. Copper does sweat. 
but the land's, if the land's like copper, it sweats, that means what's in the land is gonna rot. Basically, really terrible stuff. The land's gonna be desolate of inhabitants. Um, even the enemies are not gonna want to dwell there because there's not gonna be anything growing there. You're gonna be scattered among the nations. God forbid. And, you know, and by the way, once you're out, the land will finally be appeased from all the sabbaticals that were never kept, you know, the Shemitah years. Um, there's going to be timidity in the hearts of those who remain. Not great stuff. Eventually, though, it does end with God saying, I remember my covenant. You know, and basically, eventually, everything will be returned. But that's a nutshell of like a lot, a lot of verses of negative things. It actually just one side thing. It talks about um, like there's not going to be any satiety. That it's something with the bread, da, da, da. And the word for bread in Hebrew is chita. And the numerical value of chita, the chet and the tet, and the hey is 22. 22, there's 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The alphabet has 22 letters. And what the alphabet makes up, it's the letters of the Torah. So it's it, tries to, it, it draws this parallel. It's a little bit of a Hasidic interpretation. It draws a parallel that the study of the Torah, it's got to be it's got to be baked like bread as in something that we could digest something that we could take in right something that the soul can actually can, can take this in and it's going to be burned in the fire like what's going to bake it it's going to be baked in the fire of love of god um that's what it's supposed to be so we're not just talking about physical bread here but in a spiritual sense uh torah study is supposed to we're supposed to be able to take it in like bread and then bake it in the fire of love anyway that is most of the parsha actually because this is a shorter Torah portion, that's the most of the Torah portion. The Torah portion ends off with a whole section about if someone wants to consecrate something to the temple, to the base of Mikdash, and then can it be redeemed or not, etc. So there's different things of what could be consecrated for the base of Mikdash. So people, uh, I guess say people, places, and things almost, but a person, a house, or a field, or an animal, right? So this sheep is going to be consecrated to God, right? So I'm going to bring it as a carbon. That's that's kind of what it, what it means. So a person can vow like the endowment of a life to God, which the it's not a person, you don't actually sacrifice a person, God forbid, you bring the monetary value of the person to the base of Mikdash, which is the Mishkan. Right? This is I've endowed this person now to God. So it actually goes through the uh, the numerical breakdown of what each what the kind of life is worth. So for example, a male between the ages of six, 20 and 60 is it's 50 silver shekel, which is about 800 grams or 1.76 pounds is a silver and then a female between the ages of 20 and 60 is 30 shekel so that's 480 grams or 1.05 pounds a male between the ages of 5 and 20 20 silver shekel so it's 320 grams 11.2 ounces female between the ages of 5 and 20 is 10 shekel 160 grams slash 5.6 ounces this is the last time females <laughs> spend less than men <laughs> um a male between the ages of one month and five years old, that would be five silver shekel, 80 grams, 2.8 ounces. And a female of the same age would be three silver shekel, 48 grams or 1.68 ounces. Um, a male that's 60 and up, so over six years old, would be 15 silver shekel, 240 grams, 8.4 8, 4, 8 ounces. And a female 60 and up would be 10 shekel. So it actually gets a closer over there 160 grams and 5.6 ounces and if a person has decided they're going to do this endowment thing and then but they can't actually afford these actual prices then they'll bring whomever it is before the cone the cone will evaluate and say okay this is this is the amount that has to be paid then it goes into the whole thing of let's say if someone says okay this sheep or whatever is going to be brought as a carbon goat cattle whatever it is so what's can anything be exchanged or substituted or redeemed from the sacrifices so as a general thing, you can't just switch out an animal. If you say this is a sheep that's going to be sacrificed, that's the sheep that has to be sacrificed. For whatever reason, if someone does decide, you know, switch out, then both animals become holy and they both have to be brought up. Now, there's a whole thing that let's say someone wants to redeem like a blemished animal, right? So if an animal, we went through the blemishes a couple portions ago, but if there's something that would invalidate it as a sacrifice, so I already consecrated this animal for God, but now it can't actually be sacrificed. So I want to redeem it. So he could bring it to, to the coin and the coin could evaluate it and then he'll set a value for it. And that's the amount that has to be paid. If it's the original owner, like, hey, this is gonna be a sheep and you know whatever, then they pay that amount plus another fifth. But it's another random guy who's like, oh, I noticed this is a blemished animal and can't be sacrificed. 
you know, I'll pay the money for it, I'll redeem it, then it's just whatever the set value is. And this kind of system is kind of what works also for like, for homes, for example. So someone wants to, I'm gonna donate my house to the base of Mikdash. So it goes to the base of Mikdash treasury. And the base of Mikdash, you know, whoever runs the treasury, they can now sell it, they can sell the house and then use that money for the upkeep of the temple, right? It costs money to keep up this grand uh, building with, and there's so much going on there. And there's thousands of feet walking all, you know, all the time. There's a lot going on there. You need, you need funds for maintenance. So that's what those, that's what the sale, the funds will go to that. Um, now at that point also the house is no longer consecrated. So if they sell the house and someone buys it, just they can do whatever they want with their house. It's not this specifically holy thing at this point. Um, if someone wants to redeem it, however, before it's sold, then it kind of follows the same process of setting a, an evaluation for it and they can just, they buy it and that money is the consecrated money. So that money now must be, you know, go to the base of Mikdash, which of course it's going to do. It's the original person who wants to, they have to add a fifth of the value. Same thing happens with a field. But the fields, the way they're valued by the capacity for sowing, as in what can we actually reap from this? So it's not just, oh, this is what the space is. So it kind of says that um, barley seeds, anything that's, you could, it measures it by how much you could plant, where you could plant like up to, you'd get up to seven bushels, let's say, or 248 liters, whatever it is. And each section of that is considered, is 50 silver shekel. So if you could have double, triple, quadruple that amount, then it's double, triple, quadruple, 50 silver shekel. Um, now, they also, if there's going to be the whole redeeming kind of process go on, they have to calculate with the Yovel year. Remember we spoke about that last time, in the last part, about every 50 years, the land goes back and it's, and it's not going to be worked and etc. Basically, there's a lot of math that ensues. Big math equations happen um, to figure out what the, to prorate and figure out what the monetary value of it's going to be. Now, once the Yovel year passes, the original owner can't redeem it anymore. It's actually, this field is now owned by the by the priests. The Kohanim get to split it up and uh, use it. Um, if, however, the person, if someone, however, bought a field from, like, this is a person's inheritance. They, they had to sell the field for whatever reason, which also we kind of spoke about last time. And then I bought this field and now I'm going to consecrate this field. At Yovo, it's going to go back to the original inheritor. Or there's a lot. This, these are the laws of the Torah. This is this is what's going on. Then it goes through this thing about firstborn animals. Firstborn animals are already consecrated to God. That already has to be offered up to God. So you can't say, oh, this is going to be used for another carbon. That there is the carbon of the firstborn of the firstborn animal, and it can't be another one. Um, there's this whole thing about there's a difference between consecrating something and segregating something. Um, for for the Kohen or for the base of Mikdash. And if it's something that's like, oh, this has been like segregated, you kind of see the, the difference in the wording more, the Hebrew, it's a little bit, then the English is kind of like weird translation of it. But if it's okay, if this is going to be segregated for the Kohen, then that cannot be redeemed um, or sold. Then Torah portion totally ends off with talking about there's going to be a, seven, a second tithing. There's like the main tithing that you have to do every year, but there's also certain years there's a second tithing and that belongs to God. and from your produce, you have to consume it in, in your shalim, it's holy, etc. And then it talks about tithing animals. That has to happen every year, animals have to be tithed. So you gotta kind of stick them in this pen, then you open up the gate enough that only one at a time could go through, one single file lines. Okay, the ants must go marching one by one. And then you count, one, two, three, and every 10th one, you mark them with the red paint. You mark them with a red mark. And that 10th one is gonna be a carbon. That's gonna be a sacrifice for God, that 10th one. And you're not like, you can't use it at that point. You can't shear it and use the wool. If it's cattle, you can't use the plow line or anything like that. And there's no substituting, no redeeming it. Every 10th animal is sacrificed to God. And then it, Torah portion ends off. These are the commandments. These are the mitzvahs that Hashem gave to Moshe at Har Sinai. And then we all say, Chazak, Chazak, Venis Chazak.